Thank you, uh, Astrid, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. Again, apologies for speaking English, uh, but uh, I think it'll it'll go better if I speak if I speak English. You don't hear my German. Anyway, it's it's great to be here. Uh, I'll I'll talk about the World Digital Library. Uh, I will not focus too much on the project itself. In order to learn more about the project, if you don't know that much about it, go to the WDL website and look at it. What my focus here is on multilingualism and how we handle how we handle multilingualism in the project. So a few, a few uh, but first a few uh, background uh, points. Uh, mission and objectives. Now the World Digital Library was launched by Dr. Billington, uh, the Librarian of Congress, um, a number of years ago in cooperation with UNESCO and we have very grandiose objectives. Uh, international understanding, expanding content, uh, multilingual content uh, on the internet, uh, and also working with the developing world. I won't talk too much about that, but we have digitization centers in, in Uganda, in, in, in Iraq, in, in Egypt. We do various things. So we have these, these, these broad objectives, and the reason I mention them is, that they're, is, is partly because they're important in and of themselves, but they also affect our approach to multilingualism. We're not just trying, or I shouldn't say just, we're not, we're not uh, providing just scholarly access, we're actually trying to reach uh, regular people. Uh, and that means that our multilingualism has to be uh, it has to be quite fluent, it has to be uh, uh, really reach the people, it can't be awkward or, or, uh, uh, or, or academic or too scholarly, and that of course uh, places demand on our approach to multilingualism. Uh, a little bit of a background, uh, as I mentioned, it was launched, the site was launched by UNESCO and the Library of Congress in 2009. We now have 183 partners in 81 countries, uh, mostly national libraries, but other major research libraries, museums, archives, a few educational institutions. Um, we have a, govern a loose governance structure, an international executive council chaired by uh, Dr. Ismail Saragaldin from Bi Biblioteca Alexandrina in, in Egypt, uh, and a, a number of uh, 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 members of that uh, council from uh, around the world. <coughs> uh, and uh, UNESCO is an ex officio member of that council. Uh, the Library of Congress serves as the project manager of the, of the, uh, of the, of the uh, project. Uh, the project is supported mainly by uh, private resources. The Library of Congress puts a, quite a bit of resources into it, but we also receive uh, financial support from corporations, foundations, and individuals. Our biggest funders, uh, external funders, are the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and uh, Cutter Foundation has been, a, has been a, uh, a major supporter over the years. And we've had about 30 million users since launch, a bit more than that, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about usage later on. We have three very good German partners. Uh, Bavarian State Library in Munich, the Berlin State Library right here. In fact, Barbara Schneider Kempf, the, uh, the uh, head director of the Berlin State Library, is, is a member of that executive council that I, I mentioned. Uh, and then there's the, uh, the, the library in Dresden. Those are our three major German partners, all of whom have contributed very important content to the World Digital Library. Okay, now I turn to uh, multilingualism, more narrowly defined. More focused. The, the interface is in seven languages. So it's in the six official UN languages plus Portuguese. When we, we, when we got this assignment from Dr. Billington to create a World Digital Library, we had long debates about what languages we had to use, what languages we should use uh, in order to live up to this grandiose name of a World Digital Library. And so we, we said at a minimum we had to do the six official UN languages uh, and then we, we added Portuguese uh, partly to break the precedent of just being the six official UN languages. We didn't want to, we didn't want to establish that precedent from the beginning, uh, but also because the National Library of Brazil was one of our, found, one of our four founding partners. So from the very beginning, uh, we had a very strong relationship with, with Brazil. Um, the content is in 116 languages, and we, we actually would like to get many, many hundreds of languages in there. The, uh, the uh, Library of Congress collects in about 450 languages. UNESCO, obviously the languages most represented in terms of content are 
Arabic, Chinese, Russian, English, German, actually, even though German is not an interface language, German is one of the most five or six heavily represented languages uh, in the site. Uh, but we also have, because we work with UNESCO and because we're, we're trying to be a world digital library, we are focusing somewhat on lesser known languages. So we have lesser known and endangered languages. Uh, we're not going to save these languages from extinction by, by putting them on the World Digital Library, but we can make a small contribution to uh, letting people know that these languages exist. Uh, and these are languages from, La from South America, uh, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, even North American Indian languages. So it's a small project. It's not, in terms of content, it's not like Europeana or DPLA or, or these massive aggregating pr projects. Uh, it's a highly selected, curated collection of content. We're, we're approaching 11,000 uh, items now, manuscripts, maps, rare books, et cetera, uh, and about a half a million images. Site features, I won't read through all of this. You've got to go on the site, wdl.org. Uh, but we've, we've tried to use consistent high-quality metadata to get that, uh, to get that uh, uniformity of, of, uh, uh, of experience across the languages. Uh, we've put a lot of emphasis on curatorial and scholarly interpretation. Every item in the World Digital Library has a sort of paragraph length uh, description, which is usually written by curators and experts but written for the average intelligent reader. So we're trying, to get the, get, we're trying to get the scholarly perspective so we don't get mistakes and errors and so we can explain what is important about, uh, about an item, but not write it in a lot of scholarly jargon that the average person uh, will not be able to, uh, to understand. And then we have all of the usual um, facets that people have been showing on the different websites that we've seen this morning. Uh, expo uh, exposure to search engines. Uh, we put a big emphasis on performance. We're in the cloud. We have to be in the cloud. We, we actually, from the very beginning, we worked with uh, Akamai, the c content delivery system around the world, because it's very important that we have a, uh, you know, a one-second response time at just about every place in the world. Um, and uh, we, we also have a text-to-speech conversion and all, uh, feature in all seven languages where users can listen to the metadata and the descriptions uh, in, uh, in, in any one of the seven languages. In terms of usage, we get about, um, well, actually, that's a little bit low. We're getting about 400,000 visits a month uh, these days. Uh, about two and a half million page views every month. Um, we're, we're as, I, at least I'm personally as interested in user engagement as I am in, in, in sheer numbers of visitors. Uh, the, and, and so it's very interesting to see you know, how, many, how, how long do people on this, stay on the site and what do they actually do there. And we, we, we put a lot of focus on that. Uh, the average uh, visitor's uh, view is about six and a half pages and spends around five minutes on the site. Um, bounce rate is about 35%, which, you know, sounds bad, but is, is actually kind of low for websites. Uh, and we just, uh, we don't do that much with social media, we'll be doing more, uh, but we, uh, we, 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 we're, we're pretty active in Twitter and we have about 30, 32,000 followers. Top countries, uh, this is last year. Uh, Spain was number one, uh, US, Brazil, Mexico, and so on. Um, very heavy usage in the Spanish-speaking world. That surprised us. When we launched this site, we weren't actually sure that, uh, we, we didn't know which, uh, which of the seven languages were gonna be most heavily used, but um, it ended up being Spanish by far. Um, you can see Spain, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Peru, uh, a whole bunch of uh, um, Spanish-speaking countries. Um, but also, it's, it's pretty well balanced. You know, the U.S. is English speaking, Brazil, Portuguese, and so on. Germany is, is, is in one of our top 10, uh, top 10. We get about 700 users a day from Germany, which is, you know, not, so, not, not that much, but uh, it's, 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 you know, it should grow. But it, of course, there is no German in interface. So all of these Germans are mostly looking at the site in English, sometimes French, sometimes Russian, whatever, but usually they're seeing it in English. It would be very nice to have a German interface because I think the usage would go way, way, way up, but you know, that's an issue of cost and resources and so on. Anyway, that was, and this is, this is the very heavy Spanish usage. This is last year uh, where you see by page views, 
42% uh, uh, Spanish, then comes English, Portuguese, and so on. Uh, this is this year so far, where actually the U.S. has come up to number one, which, uh, which makes me happy. It helps with political support for the project and so on to have. But it's still only, you know, only, only about a sixth is, 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 is uh, a seventh is about U is U.S. usage. Brazil, uh, Spanish-speaking usage is still most, uh, uh, um, most common, uh, but uh, because it's spread over many countries. And you can see the language of pages views is evening out a little bit more, so English and Spanish are about even now. And there's tremendous room for growth in, in Chinese, Arabic, uh, Chinese and Arabic especially. Uh, and we've been pushing that. Arabic usage has been increasing a lot of late. Chinese usage has been increasing. And of course, with the hundreds of millions of people that speak those two languages, uh, there's tremendous, uh, tremendous scope for growth there. OK. Uh, very quickly, uh, the tra our translation model, which is to say, what do we do? And our translation method, uh, which is, how do we do it? OK, the translation model is, is straightforward. Um, we, we do all metadata descriptions, narrative content, and so on in the seven languages. We're aiming for an equivalent user experience in each of these languages. Anything that appears in one language appears in, in the other seven. This is a little different from, say, Wikipedia, where you can, uh, an article in Wikipedia in German can be different from an article in French and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the approach that we've taken. We've, uh, we've, uh, we've tried to get that equivalent user experience. The only exception, of course, is full text search, where we go into the books and we only search you know, uh, French books in French and English books in English and so on and so forth. Um, Users access, of course, is key to the language of the browser. And I think that most people around the world don't even know that it's a multilingual website, which is kind of a scary thought. But you know, you have that little language flag up in the upper right hand. And I think it, you know, it comes up as a Portuguese website in Brazil, and it comes up as a Chinese website in China, and so on. Uh, and people, it's only when they switch uh, languages uh, that they, or when they find that icon, they find it's different, uh, uh, that it's multilingual. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of scary because it means that you, you're, you're not just a, an English website that's giving a little foreign language access you know, as a kind of plus. Uh, you are actually passing yourself off as a Portuguese website in Brazil and a, uh, bitter comments from Portugal, by the way, about our Brazil, use of Brazilian Portuguese uh, and a Chinese website in China and so on. So it, it, creates, uh, it creates a lot of... Um, it, it's a very demanding translation model. Um, we, as I mentioned, we, uh, we are not adding additional languages right now, but the ones I would really like to add would be Hindi, German, and Japanese. Uh, Hindi is really a big, big gap. We have a lot of users from India, but again, they're using it in, in English. Uh, we don't use any on-the-fly machine translation, um, but we don't rule it out for future languages. One of the things we might do is say, okay, these seven are none to WDL standards, but if you want, you know, you want to do Serbian or, 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 uh, or some other language, you know, here's, here's, here's the machine access to it. Um, and, of course, we use a lot, we get a lot of feedback. Okay, this is the method. How do we do it? Um, we have uh, full-time staff uh, and contractors using Trados uh, translation software. We have huge translation memories. We're using machine-assisted translation, uh, not machine translation, but we, the, the translators are all in the Trados soft, software and we're constantly building up these, these memories. We do that for two reasons. It increases the pace of translation by about a factor of 10 at least, by a matter of fact. And metadata, of course, by definition, is very, is very repetitious. So you get tremendous amount of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, increase in productivity by using these translation memories. But also that, in in that increases the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, that enforces the consistency uh, across, the, uh, across the site so that you get the uniform search results. Um, and we, we rely on an authoritative English version. Now, this is, this is controversial, but you know, we don't do any sort of Chinese to Russian translation or, or you know, Arabic to Portuguese or whatever. We go into English, uh, and then we go into the seven, uh, into the other six languages from that. Um, we, we, we also receive a lot of metadata in languages other than the seven. 
Uh, we get metadata in Lithuanian, we get metadata in, in German, and of course that also has, that all has to be translated into English first and, uh, before, and that's actually quite an expensive and difficult process. And then we use a three-step process of translational review uh, through the contractors, the native speaker of the target language, the second is the native speaker of the target language reviews, and then the native speaker of the source language uh, reviews that. This is all done at the, by the contractors. And then we bring it back uh, to our own uh, reviewers in the XML files, uh, and we directly, we employ our own reviewers on staff at the Library of Congress to do a final check. And the reason we want to have staff people for that is we want, we want them to take their time to get it right. The contractors have, to, you know, they only make their money by, a, you know, certain, certain cents per word, and so they go quickly. We want to have some people who have an interest in getting it right, even if it takes them two hours or whatever, even if it goes back, means going back to the author, going back to the partner. Uh, so that, so we, we have that, um, uh, that, that extra, that extra uh, uh, review at the, at, the, at the final point. Um, let me just, before I could show some content very quickly, but let, let me just make one quick, I think I'm just about out of time, but, but let me make one quick point about translation. Translation is difficult, but it's not as difficult as people make it out to be. It is expensive. We spent about $400,000 on translation last year, and it involves, and it involves, um, it involves uh, technology. You need to use the latest technology, and you need to throw a lot of money at it. But translation itself is less difficult than people sometimes think it is. The really difficult challenge is getting correct authoritative metadata in the first place, in our case in English, but in, in, uh, in, in, in whatever language you're working in. I find that, or we found that most metadata, I should, should say most, that's wrong, about a third to a half of all metadata that comes in from partners, including the Library of Congress, which is you know, supposed to have, you know, so I'm not, has some kind of mistake in it. Uh, and it's only when you start writing descriptions and you start uh, translating, and these translators start saying, well, what does this mean? And we use thesauri and so on. But the, the, the biggest problem is not translation per se. It's getting a, an authoritative English, in our case, but it could be any, whatever language you're working in, uh, version. Okay, uh, my time is up. Here are just some of the content on the WDL, including from our German partners. Uh, so I'd urge you to go on the site, take a look at it. It's great cultural. This is, of course, in, cons consistent with our Jewish theme of this morning. This is uh, from Berlin State Library, marvel with marvelous Hebrew, Hebrew things on World Digital Library from, from National Library of Israel, from the Russian libraries, from libraries in Germany, from the, uh, the Spanish, the French, and so on. So that's, that's a, a, a run through on World Digital Library as it relates to multilingualism. And, but please do take a look at the site because uh, it, it, that's where you really see the content.